But let's talk about that story and the other main news stories with Times columnist Alice Thompson and PR consultant and political commentator Alex Dean. Good morning to both of you. Hi. Good morning to you. Uh, let's talk about Belarus then. Uh, Western countries have expressed outrage at the forced diversion of the plane carrying a Belarusian opposition blogger. The Ryanair plane was forced to land after the regime called in a bomb threat while it was in the country's airspace. Um, Alex, start with you. We seem to live in a world where almost actions like this take place with effective impunity. Everyone says the right thing, yes. everyone talks about sanctions, but life goes on uh, and this type of action will be repeated somewhere else uh, anytime soon. Yeah, that's right. The Greeks used to say that everyone knows the right thing to do, but only the Spartans do it. What we need is a Spartan, right? We need somebody to say, right, I'm going to sanction you and I'm going to ban you from my airports and then hope that the moral pressure for other people to follow them takes place after that. Um, Alice, do you think that, that is it just this question of economic sanctions? Is that because that, that feels like, and this is probably correct, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a warmonger here, but once you take away any form of uh, intervention in another country, whatever they do, you are left with economic sanctions. And is that enough? Do they need to be imposed in a different way? What do you think? Well, they're never enough, are they? I mean, we've, we've always imposed economic sanctions when we can, but you could do it on airspace as well. But I, I feel it's such an extraordinary, weird story. And we get these stories, you know, every now and again, like the Salisbury poisonings. And when you have those kind of stories, they, they tend to be sensitive sensationalized and you know and it, it, you feel you're in a film but nothing ever happens afterwards and it is extraordinary and I remember interviewing once Mark Sedwell and he was the cabinet secretary during both Brexit and uh, the um, whole of the virus at the beginning and he said the Salisbury um, situation had been the worst situation he was in in the whole time he was in number 10 because they just couldn't get over it I mean they they yeah. couldn't believe it was happening and that's that's what it feels like now it just feels like you're in a story and that's the point about they both involve Russia and it's an interesting point this Alex because Russia on the UN Security Council that means nothing will ever take place on the UN and Russia backs the Belarusian government so the UN will do nothing at all here and they've not done anything really in the last the few decades on any of these global situations so if and, and if as alice is saying it, it takes place in salisbury a british person is killed on british soil by a foreign state and nothing happens well it, it feels like not almost quite, no, nothing would ever happen it's so that for, there are two d distinctions first of, the first is that it's not the case that nothing happened after Salisbury. We expelled more diplomats than has ever happened before in peacetime and our allies followed. So we should do that, right? We should first of all uh, expel their diplomats. The second distinction, uh, and when we can, which is Europe's last dictatorship in Belarus, we are on one view we should be expelling them anyway. Uh, and the second um, distinction is that it's not Russia per se. Of course the Russian bear is behind this, but Belarus is supposedly an independent state. Well, as we've just heard on your bulletin, they've got a state airline. We can pull their slots at all UK airports. Sanctions on wealthy individuals work. Restrictions on their wealth in our countries work. Reducing travel opportunity for their regime's leaders work. We know what to do here, Stig. It's a question of whether we'll do it. But the question I... I... The challenge I'd say back to you is, you say they work, but they don't work in Myanmar because the people who are doing it have had restrictions imposed and the, the, the military junta is still in place. They haven't worked on Putin and his cronies have had sanctions imposed. Putin is still the force that he is. They work to a point and they can go no further. Yeah, Belarus has ambitions to be more than North Korea or more than Myanmar, right? It aspires to be a European country. A massive setback when they rigged their elections and returned fake, fake results to keep their dictator in place. But that is not the desire and direction of travel for Belarus as a whole. And for the uh, blameless people of Belarus, there can be nothing better to show you that the, the, the West is on their side than sanctioning their corrupt kleptocrat leaders who've now you know, done the worst thing uh, yes, and hijacked a plane out of international travel and tried and kidnapped somebody uh, to show that, uh, how disgraceful their leadership is. What we do now matters, not just in terms of showing our opprobrium for this kind of behaviour, but encouraging a peaceful, democratic rebellion in Belarus, in Belarus so that people can try and get rid of this regime. Uh, let's talk about the BBC now. The Culture Secretary has written in The Times today, accused the BBC of a we-know-best attitude in the wake of the Martin Bashir scandal, uh, Oliver Dowden says the BBC is guilty of groupthink and needs to project British values if it is to survive competition from the streaming giants. Um, Alice, what do you think? Do you detect a we know best attitude at the BBC? I think as a cultural institution, it has got a we know best attitude. But I think this was very much rogue with Martin Bashir. And I think the newspapers were complicit as well with uh, the royal family. But... 
he wasn't just doing it with one interview. We now realise that with Michael Jackson there were issues, with George Best there were issues, that, that he was this rogue character. What's extraordinary is that the BBC didn't realise this and didn't come out with it earlier. I mean, we've, we've spent 27 years. It's phenomenal. Mm. And that, that's what I think the BBC needs to look at. I don't think we could turn this into a whole massive issue again on Brexit and on whether they're not there. You know, they, they, they're they actually politically um, unbiased. Well, I think we can. Well, they're going to, aren't they? <laughs> they should. A minute, don't worry. We, we, can, we can stop that. I mean, I think... I think that's the problem, is the BBC is always bashed by every single side, and politicians love this. And you could see them just lining up yesterday to go for the BBC. But quite honestly, in the end, you know, actually, you know, th what the BBC did, yes, was wrong, but it, you know, there are so many other issues that are going on that to hear Pretty Patel going on and on about it being the sort of worst thing that's ever happened, I think really is slightly hypocritical. Mm. Well, um, look... You ask, Alex, if, is there a go on, Alex. Yeah, you ask if there's a we know best attitude. The arrogance yeah. is based into the business model, right? This is so uniquely high quality as a product that we can't allow you to decide whether you want to have it. You must have it if you have on to BBC TV at all <laughs> on pain of imprisonment. Otherwise, you can't mm. receive any broadcasting of any kind. The arrogance comes from the insistence of the retention of this ridiculous business model. And, every, and that says everything you want, need to know about the organisation until you come to things like this. And Alice says, truthfully and rightly, this was a long time ago and it might be a, a one-off in the Bashir example. But it's not, mm. it's the fall that's going to kill you. It's the cover-up ever since. And the cover-up demonstrates the arrogance, doesn't it? And it, it caused the irony, ultimately, of the BBC doing a cover-up which causes the delay and then using the standard defence, which is it was a long time ago. It's like, some, it's like a, a man killing his parents and then asking for mercy because he's an orphan. They caused the delay. OK. Um, Alex, um, you will have read um, Oliver Dowden's piece in The Times and, yeah. and he does say about you know, how much he supports the BBC and cherishes it and all the rest of it. But I, I'm actually really interested in this well, idea flannel, of... You think he doesn't? No, no, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure he does, but I think he shouldn't. Mm -hmm. I think the obvious, this is a bit like our last example. We'll all, we'll all talk about things a lot and then not do anything. The mm. obvious action here is not to renew their charter. They don't deserve to have a royal charter as an organisation. And the debate has moved, in my mind, from privatising the BBC, which is the old debate, to what we should mm. do in the future, which is breaking it up and selling it for parts. Goodness me. Right. Um, what I wanted to ask you was that Oliver Dowden in his piece talks about um, the BBC projecting British values. So uh, if, we, if we ignore your idea for a second that the BBC <laughs> continues as is, how can it project British values? What does that mean? Well, so Britain has great soft power image around the world. And I think one of the mm. mistakes we've probably made is taking the World Service out of the Foreign Office where it belongs. So when we break it up, we can put it back there, can't we? <laughs> What does break it up mean? I'm interested in that. What do you mean? You, you, that is privatisation. Is that what you're saying? You, you break it up and so you, you sort of sell yeah, BBC One as a... As a most, as... most people talk about, let's go, okay, off the BBC goes, the, the mighty ship of state, state sails is just not it's not a state broadcaster anymore. I think it's too late for that. It, as an organisation, it's rotten to the core, as we see with cover-up after cover-up. It's not just Bashir, you know, Jimmy Savile, Stuart Hall, smearing Cliff Richards, smearing Lord McAlpine. The, li the one you haven't even mentioned is the girl, the woman who's been um, unveiled as having said that Hitler was right, who was appointed by the BBC to oversee impartiality on the Israel-Palestine question, still in post today. So, look, they're rotten to the core. We can't just privatise it and sell it off. We've got to scrap it Oh, my it goodness. Up. We've got to break okay, it let's just, You're saying the rest okay, of the media is all Alice. perfect. Yeah, I think you can't really say... I mean, the fact that the idea that it's just the BBC and the rest of the media is all this sort of paragon of virtue is completely ridiculous. Of course, you know, the media's got problems. The media's had issues, particularly with the royal family. If you go back, um, the tabloids, but I've worked at the Telegraph and the Times and I can't say that we're completely innocent of anything, that we've never made any mistakes. I mean, the problem is, sure. as you say, the cover-up. But I would be horrified if we did get rid of the BBC. I mean, I do think if we're going to have to want to be a global power, I think the BBC is one of our greatest assets. And you can say well, oh, that's uh, old fashioned. and that. But actually, the BBC has produced a lot of what we do as Britain feel that it, it is punching above our weight. And, and BBC Alice, does other, punch above our weight. I'm not sure the argument that others do other bad things is enough to deflect from the BBC situation. No, but, but why it, should it just on, be the BBC that's ripped apart but, and torn apart and then is, you know, you well, were basically sold off like some used car? It, it, it's the one that the state has control over. But let, let's take your defence that other media organisations are bad as well. You heard what I set out, you know, um, sexual abuse, Stuart Hall cover-up, sexual abuse, Rolf Harris cover-up, sexual abuse, Jimmy Savile cover-up. Is there another media organisation that's done that? Are you saying there's anyone else that's behaved like that? 
Well, I think if you look back over the years, yes, all organisations and all newspapers as well as other institutions have had those sort of issues. We, we know that. We don't need to go through the every single mm. phone tapping issue here. But, I mean, there have been a lot of different issues that have gone on in different organisations. And, yeah, we do have to come down on them. And the whole point is to come down on them. But just to pick out the BBC and say only that one is the one that we've got to flog off and get okay. rid of, it seems insane, really. Uh, okay, okay, let's call a halt to these proceedings. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll be discussing this for the full half hour. Um, Alex Dean and Alice Thompson, thank you very much for the moment. Stay there. We'll come back and discuss a few more issues uh, in a moment. This is Breakfast on Times Radio with Asma Mayer and Stig Abel. Yes, it is 9.18. We're talking over the issues of the day with Times columnist Alice Thompson and PR consultant and political commentator Alex Dean. Uh, let's move on to uh, Dominic Cummings. Um, if you looked on social media on Saturday night, it was Eurovision, 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 Eurovision. Dominic Cummings <laughs> tweeting about uh, what the government did back in March. Eurovision, 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 Eurovision. It was an extraordinary <laughs> spectacle, it really was. Uh, uh, Boris Johnson's former chief advisor, he's been preparing to give evidence to MPs this week by issuing a volley of tweets. He said that the Prime Minister was forced into a bodged COVID plan because the government did not realise its initial strategy would cost hundreds of thousands of lives and lead to an economic disaster. Um, Alice, let's start with you. Does the fact that there's clearly a psychodrama at play here, this is a rejected man turning on his former allies, a man who was at the centre of government is now criticising decisions made by the centre of government. Should that obscure that he might have some interesting things to say here or will it obscure that, do you think? I think he does have some interesting things to say. I think, extraordinarily, Boris Johnson's been quite lucky with Barnard Castle, actually, because that's really negated quite a lot of what um, Dominic is going to say, because if you know, the general public thinks of Dominic Cummings now and thinks at that time when he sat behind the desk and tried to exonerate himself, and that's what they think of him. They think of him as a man who cheated and who didn't play by the rules. And so I think he's going to find it easier, Boris Johnson, to wave aside anything that Dominic says, and some of it will be fascinating, and it is. I mean, we're now on sort of 56, 57, aren't we, of the tweets that are just going out, this incredibly long thread. And I think the idea of herd immunity is an interesting one to look at. And I think also the idea that, you know, that, that where, where we went wrong and when, although I think the idea that Boris Johnson with his um, trying to get his book done on Shakespeare, which is why he didn't turn up for several of the first meetings, is also interesting. Yeah, whether he'll say that. But the question, I suppose, uh, Alex, there's a certain insouciance about Dominic Cummings, who's sort of almost pretending he wasn't there himself when he criticises all of these decisions of central government. Well, he's also that. been very destructive, hasn't he? I mean, that's, that's the issue. He loves being destructive. He loves pulling things apart. So he didn't really naturally suit being a number 10. He likes being the outsider, chafing yeah. against everyone else and being, you know, he's, he's always agitating against everyone. So it never really worked when he was the insider who was meant to be organising everything. But, but Alex, maybe the question, Alex, does that make him too easy to dismiss? Will people be able to say he's, 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 too, he's too scorned yes. and therefore actually we shouldn't listen to what he has to say? What do you think, Alex? I don't know if it's that. And indeed on the garden stuff, I thought there was quite an unpleasant kind of manhunt on him in which I found myself defending Dominic Cummings. And, and were that sort of thing to happen again, I probably would again. But this is different to that. What I think is going to undermine him in the public eye is the way in which he goes about it. For me, it's not Barnard Cummings. It's the sort of... It's Bar Barnard <laughs> Castle. It's the sort of... <laughs> it's the... Freudian slip. Yeah. It's, the, it's the teenage tantrum approach to... And another thing I hate about you, Dad, in the you know, 57th <laughs> tweet comes out. And, you know, poor, poor old patient Dad sort of rolls his eyes and says, yes, just get in the car. Yeah. You know, he, he's try, he except if, rather than just telling his parents how much he hates them for having brought him up in a nice middle-class house and sent him to school, he's trying to bring down the government. And I, I think that's what's going to undermine him, the kind of rage and jealousy approach. It's not, the, it's not the Barnard Castle stuff, it's that. But he is actually exposing a really interesting philosophical problem the government has, which was mm. herd immunity, which was mentioned in public by a governmental adviser. Um, uh, although it was never, and the question of what you mean by herd immunity and the extent to which it was a policy, it does reveal a, a problem the government had in those first months, which was how much to let the disease spread, how many deaths they were willing to put up with, uh, whether they yeah. should have locked down quicker, what they should have done about nursing homes. I mean, he's getting into a, a central flaw in the government's position here, isn't it? Which is they he, didn't act promptly there, enough and they were acting, <coughs> facing in the wrong direction some of the time. Stick, there is something here, right? Let's Let's... Government it won't admit it, but let's agree that the, these things, you sometimes change your mind in government. And it's, it seems that our, we were kind of pursuing a herd immunity path, and then we stopped pursuing that path. And for me, there's nothing dishonourable about it, saying we thought we were doing the right thing in, with, with the advice of the experts and so forth. We thought we were doing the right thing going in direction A. The facts changed. We changed our minds, and then we went in direction B. And so the other part for 
the kind of let me tell you what was so wrong a year ago approach from Cummings is what's happened since when we had a world leading vaccine programme, which is sort of skips over to dot dot dot. And therefore, I hate Boris. That's an interesting point. Do you think that Boris is now in a stronger... You mentioned that the Barnard Castle phenomenon weakens Dominic Cummings, but Alice, presumably the, the, the corollary of that is also the post-Cummings period has seen probably better messaging coming out of Downing Street, a greater grip on things, more caution, and the vaccine programme. So is Boris Johnson stronger now than he, say, would have been six months ago and better able to withstand an attack from coming? Definitely. I think the vaccine um, issue with Kate Bingham was the really crucial turning point for them. And that's what Dominic Cummings should have done. I mean, he was always meant to be this incredible forward-thinking person who could think back and, you know, forwards into the next century. He was just, you know, he would have been the vaccine chief. And I think he'd love to have been the one that said, I, I own this it's mine that's what I realized that was going to work and it didn't it wasn't him actually and you know in the end it was Kate Bingham being incredibly efficient and organized I'm not sure how much Boris Johnson it was but his optimism did work there because he obviously thought the vaccine might work and the countries that thought the vaccine might work have done better recently because they believed in it and they thought it might be a possible outcome not herd immunity yeah, and also he seems to have a problem with Matt Hancock uh, uh, as well, doesn't he, don't you think, Alex? He seems to really hate yeah. Matt Hancock. And Matt Hancock has a bit of a vaccine halo as well, doesn't he? Well, it's Matt Hancock weird. has kept it's... going, hasn't he? I mean, that's the extraordinary thing about him is that he hasn't cracked. You know, his wife got it, everyone else around him got it, he had it. But he's gone through the entire year just solidly you know, keeping bashing away. And, yeah, he's got a lot of it wrong, but at the same time you do have to admire him because he's almost the opposite of Dom Cummings, isn't he? He's this calm... Um, get on with it. Yes, I've made mistakes. And, and I think actually in the end, he probably will come out of this quite well. Do you agree with that, Alex? I do. And I, um, I, gosh, we are going to owe a debt of gratitude to some of the people who've been in the bunker throughout this stuff, trying to, I mean, whatever you think of Matt Hancock, I don't think anyone can say he's been doing anything other than doing his best to, to help our country. And to, not to mention a, a rival of, of, of your station and, and um, newspapers, but the Telegraph picture cartoon today of uh, Dominic Cummings as the last soldier in the jungle firing on HMS <laughs> Vax tax task force saying come on out the fighting's over <laughs> you know, there, there is something to that no time for this Honest Conversations on Times Radio with Santander. Whatever financial difficulties you're facing, Santander are here to help you get back on track. Find out more at santander.co.uk Yep, it's time for Honest Conversations. Honest. Did you hear that, both of you? <laughs> this year's right. Sunday Times. I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure, Alex, I'm sure, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure you won't hold back. This year's Sunday Times Rich List identified a record 171 UK billionaires. That's 24 more than in 2020 and the biggest jump in 33 years. And we're not actually going through the, the, the whys and the wherefores of that. I want to ask each of you individually. Alice, I'll start with you. Would you want to be a billionaire? No. I have actually interviewed billionaires, so I, mm. I have a vague idea of what it's like, and it's definitely not me, and I hate yachts, so I get seasick. <laughs> uh, but a few you million to buy a yacht. I'm not sure it's obligatory. <laughs> <laughs> they all seem to do it, though, don't they? So when you've interviewed them, do, how do they appear? Well, Bill Gates is the one I've interviewed most, and I've interviewed him three or four times, and actually I always thought he had the perfect life with the perfect <laughs> wife and the perfect children and the plane that took the horses all around the world. And, you know, actually it all sound rather amazing. And now I just look at it and think, thank God it's not me. So um, mm. I'm much more wary now, but I, I also think, I'd, I'm not saying I wouldn't like a few million, it's just the billion mm. tag I'm not sure I'd like. Yeah, I suppose you could give it away. Well, that's what Bill Gates said he did, and it still didn't work, did it? No, he had too much. He just couldn't give enough of it away. Um, Alex, what about you? Not a millionaire, I, I just, a billionaire. A billionaire. I, well, I dare say I'd accept that grave and weighty responsibility. <laughs> and it, 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 in fact, if that is the offer of my starting salary with Times Radio, I accept. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, OK, what would you do with your billions of pounds? Um, I think I would... Oh, I'd keep on working. It wouldn't change me a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, the, you can never trust. You could not trust the person that says that. Oh, no one. No. no one seriously believes that, do they? Oh. I'd buy. I'd buy a, another couple of homes, I think, and I would. Uh, I, I would spend my time writing and reading. I've got, you know. <laughs> I'd, I'd do a, a few more books rather than um, working in the city as I do. No offence to my clients and colleagues. And what about philanthropy? I mean, when you've got that much money, you can afford to try to help people or organisations or countries. I would. And there are some organisations that I, um, I think have um, great appeal and are under 
uh, supported because they're not particularly sexy in the public eye. And there's a lot you can do with that kind of money in research for conditions that are less fashionable, um, mm. in support for institutions which, which just aren't considered that kind of trendy anymore. Um, mm. I'd certainly um, support some of the local organisations in, uh, in Suffolk that my late father supported and I'd like to do more for them. So, yeah, I would. You could buy a chunk of the BBC, Alex. Uh, this oh, one, do you know what, Stig? If you want to, if you want to voluntarily support the BBC more, you write them a check. They'll cash it. Yeah. Doesn't require the license fee, does it? I'm just thinking. I mean, maybe you could own Radio One or something like that, Alex. You could, you could buy and then, it. Yeah. And then ceremonially break it up. Yeah. Not a bad idea. Yeah. Goodness He's the, the Richard what? Gear from Pretty Woman character. You buy, buy the yes. businesses. And, and there's a reference. There's a reference. Uh, well, that's all we've got time for for our conversation this morning. Our thanks go to Alice Thompson, who is a, is a wonderful columnist for The Times, and for PR consultant and political commentator Alex Dean, who is going off to present The Mar Show this week, I believe, for his beloved BBC. <laughs> I don't mean that. Yeah. I think I do admire I'd, a fourth... I'd pay money to see that. Yeah, exactly. I do admire a forthright opinion. That's it. There's no, there's no harm in that. Whatever. People, are, you know, people, are, people are agreeing. People are both agreeing and disagreeing with him on... on Social media and text, it must say. They do. Annette says, though, he is right about Dominic Cummings' teenage approach to his attack on the PM and government. It's all, I hate you, Dad. And I think there's, there's probably something in that. Uh, Alice Thompson and Alex Steve, thank you very much indeed.